Welcome to Sardar TV. I'm Vaishali Jain. We have the pleasure of having Mehran Asadi with us today. Mehran is CEO of the insurance company National Life Group, which is the subject of a book called Cause, a business strategy for standing out in the sea of sameness, written by best-selling authors Jackie and Kevin Freeberg, and he's here to tell us more. Mehran, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Start up by telling us what the central theme of your book is at a very high level. Well, Cause is about mission-driven companies who are purposeful and are on a mission to do something special. And uh, to that end, it's a uh, story of uh, National Life Group, uh, a 167-year-old company which has been always committed uh, to bring peace of mind to everyone we touch. And uh, the industry that we are part of is about educating the masses and making sure that they have financial protection for their retirement and also for unexpected events in, in life. So we view our industry as being an industry that's about doing good every single day. And uh, at National Life, we are putting our emphasis on Middle America, the most underserved segment of the market. There are 70 million households who are either underinsured or have no insurance and financial protection. And uh, that's our mission. That's, where, that's our focus as a company. Who's the target audience of the book? Well, it can be anybody. Jackie and Kevin Freiberg have done a phenomenal job in laying out why cause uh, driven companies uh, make sense and why in a sea of sameness that exists in corporate America, mission-driven companies stand out. So it is about people who are looking for opportunities to be part of the financial services industry or any industry. The idea is find your passion and make that commitment. Be part of something that's special, right? And in this day and age, people like to respond to a higher calling, be part of something which has meaning behind it. Uh, so it's about potential recruits, it's about clients, it's about people who are already part of organizations. It is a book which is inspiring and also it is a guide, it is a recipe for business strategies that are not just about the balance sheet. It is about the balance sheet, it is about culture, the secret sauce from my point of view to any successful business. So Cause was written by Jackie and Kevin Freeberg. They also wrote the international bestseller Nuts. That's which, correct. Which is about the success yeah. of Southwest Airlines. That's correct. Tell us why they wrote the book on the National Life Group. I started a project about six years ago in our company, which was tied to culture, right? As a newly appointed chief executive officer for National Life, this 167-year-old company, I had to lay out my objectives, my goals as a chief executive officer. And I stood in front of my entire field force of 22,000 uh, people and 1,000 associates in our home office. And I basically said, look, I am going to focus on uh, midterm and long-term strategy because short-term is our operational plan which we are executing. I'm going to focus on performance, top line, bottom line, and every measurement in between. And people, which fuels number one and number two. Big element of number three, people, is tied to culture, right? So I decided to partner with highly inspiring and high quality consultant named Jackie Freiberg. Uh, and as a matter of fact, when I was interviewing Jackie, I said, Jackie, I'm not looking for a flyby consultant. Uh, I'm looking for somebody who wants to be committed to what we are trying to do at National Life in terms of being a culture which is about servant leadership. And she started working with us about three and a half years ago. And she sort of viewed, I think, when we started this relationship as oh, this is insurance, it's sleepy, it's traditional. And I told her right up front, I said, you're gonna find this industry as being very interesting. 
I know you have given advice in terms of strategy and culture and business development to different industries. But this is an industry which can use innovation in major ways. And so she's been part of our family working with us and uh, she decided to write a book about mission-driven companies and in their book, Jackie and Kevin have looked at a bunch of businesses and we are humbled by the fact that they decided to showcase National Life, this 167-year-old company, as the company that is doing it right in the sea of sameness. I also want you to know, we are not a finished product, right? There is this next level and the next level. But I think after working with us, she realized that we are different. There is certain level of energy and enthusiasm, which is tied to that higher calling, right? That I was talking about, that makes this company very unique and special. Tell us why people should buy this book. Well, first of all, again, I think Jackie and Kevin have done a great job of writing a book that is easy to read, easy to digest, and it is a recipe for success for people and for corporations. It's a great book even for entrepreneurs, right? I, I really do believe it is a recipe of how do you start with a dream, a vision? How do you take that worthy dream and vision and sort of translate it into the goals and objectives and a worthy cause which creates a movement. So I'm a huge fan of the book for obvious reasons. I am biased about the book, but at the same time I have tremendous respect for the writers because they've been around for three decades almost and they have seen the good and bad and ugly and from my point of view they are giving a very comprehensive perspective around what it takes to succeed, what kind of people you need to attract and how do you create that authentic, positive energy to deliver ROE while people are having fun and they are part of something that they believe in their mind and in their heart. So to me, that's why I'm such a huge fan of this book. Can you define what a cause-driven organization is? A cause-driven organization is one that has a clear understanding of what is the vision, mission, values that they are part of. A cause-driven organization is one that is focusing on the why behind what they do versus how they do it and what they do. You know, it's the why, right? So in our case, 167-year-old company, right? We had a vision statement, we had a mission statement and value document, which was fantastic, right? And there were great words in there, but it wasn't easily understood and digested. You know, one of our mantras at National Life is simple is hard. So we basically went through a process as part of our culture building process in looking at our vision, mission, and value statement and really examine the why behind what we do as National Life. The why is to bring peace of mind to everyone we touch. That is what insurance, or as we like to say, assurance is all about, right? And our mission is to make good on our promises because that's what insurance is all about, right? The commitments that we make to you are the commitments that we have to stand behind 30, 40, 60, 70, 80 years from now, fulfilling those promises. And our value statement, which was two pages long, it actually went to few words. Do good, be good, make good. Our intentions, our actions, and the outcome, right? And in today's national life, everybody can recite that for you because they understand it and they can describe it actually to you as to why they can relate to the words that we are using. And to me, that is what is unique about cause-driven organizations. What are some of the differentiating aspects of a cause-driven company when it comes to things like talent and culture? 
I think uh, talented uh, and capable people always want to be uh, part of orga organizations that inspire them to take their capabilities, or as the saying goes, their game to the next level. And culture is the secret sauce that attracts talent. People want to be part of something that's relevant. People want to be part of a community that is focused on doing something very unique and special. In an insurance company, we have people with diverse backgrounds. We have actuaries, we have investment people, we have technology people, we have marketing and distribution people. Uh, so we have number of skill sets. So the question is, how do you create a rallying cry around what you're trying to accomplish, where do you want to go, and why at the end of the day it's going to matter? And to that end, cause becomes actually the glue that connects everyone to that common vision and purpose. And that is what we have created at our company, right? And I have seen that evolve right in front of our eyes by being consistent in terms of the goals and objective and commitment to a culture that is unique and show up and communicate in authentic ways. I can tell you at National Life, probably seven or eight years ago, we had access to the different pool of talent versus today. Today, we have more choices. So you think that this higher caliber talent is drawn to a certain type of culture that you've built? Is that what it is? Your absolutely, reputation? absolutely. So uh, let me give you a perfect example. Over the past uh, year, uh, we have done fair amount of recruiting in terms of looking for uh, certain competencies and talent uh, because of a significant growth that we have experienced at National Life. And when people come in to uh, go through the interview process, right? Uh, first of all, they've done their homework and they have gone online and they have actually seen cause and they have ordered copy of cause and they have learned about our company. And in one of the interviews that my chief investment officer was conducting two weeks ago, within the interview, the candidate that we are very much interested in actually pulled copy of cause out and held it up to my chief investment officer and said, how real is this? Our chief investment officer, it was like, this is real. You gonna be there next week and you can press the flash and you can do your own underwriting and due diligence of how real our culture is, albeit not a finished product. So uh, top talent gravitates towards uh, culture that is purposeful and is responding to a higher calling. Um, look, I'm not naive to say compensation doesn't matter, but when you take a look at surveys that are done among top talents in our country, compensation is actually not number one. People wanna be part of something that they're gonna enjoy and they're gonna, they are proud uh, to speak about uh, because everybody cares about their legacy. So is there a financial correlation between cause and doing good within the organization? Absolutely. So there are many organizations who uh, think about or has, have an opinion about culture as being soft, right? Culture shows up at the top line and bottom line results of a company. When you are a part of a worthy cause and when you're committed to the profession that you are part of, in my opinion, you take a different view and perspective, conviction and commitment to what you are trying to accomplish. Therefore, when you are part of a movement of uh, taking care of middle America, the most underserved segment of the market, you know who your clients are. Your clients are from Main Street, not Wall Street right? Your clients are your neighbors, the small business owners, teachers, nurses, police officers, people in your community. So those people are real, right? And part of the products and services we offer basically protects families 
and ensures that there is uh, proper plans for one's retirement. So to that end, you show up with the level of different level of conviction and commitment to growing your customer base, right? Therefore, growing your top line. And at our company, profitability is not a four letter word. In order to continue to serve our clients, we have to have the proper capital which sits behind the promises that we are making. So at National Life, for the past six years, we have experienced tremendous growth at the top line. Our industry is an industry that is growing at low single digit, right, to flat. At National Life, we've been growing at a double digit at the top line, and also we've been increasing our bottom line results in terms of core earnings and pre-tax operating income and net income at record levels for our 167 year old company. So the proof is there that culture shows up on your balance sheet. Can you give us an, some examples of other companies that are considered cause driven? Well, uh, the most famous one from my point of view is Google, right? And you're probably wondering, how do you go from financial services insurance to one of the most admired tech companies in the world? Google's vision is to organize information for the world, right? And it's no wonder they are so successful in what they have done uh, because it's not about technology. It is about the why. Why do what Google does? Take a look at how they have changed our lives forever across the world. Take a look at Apple, right? <sighs> My gosh, once again, they have reshaped the way we think, the way we live. So those are examples of mission-driven companies where you have seen clearly they are extremely successful at the top line and bottom line. So there are many examples out there. And I think when you are responding to that higher calling uh, in terms of being a mission-driven company, you also end up doing things the right way. One of my uh, favorite phrases with my teammate when they ask me, what do you think about this issue or that issue? And my response usually is, what do you think? Well, this is the right approach to do it, but I have to take all these other circumstances under consideration. And my advice always is, do the right thing, right? That's the way mission-driven companies think. Our industry, uh, basically in insurance, uh, which is one of the oldest industries in the world and uh, also in the US, needs to start rethinking uh, about how we brand ourselves and how we uh, educate the public around what is as at the core of what we do and why the industry is about doing good. So the book also talks about other companies that define their business performance with purpose. They give an example of PepsiCo. Can you tell us a little bit more about how the company has done this? Well, uh, I think that's another example of a company redefining itself in terms of being a, a beverage company versus a company that's focusing on enhancing life experience in terms of uh, their products and services and gravitating towards more healthy beverages uh, versus colored water with a bunch of sugar in it, basically. So I, th I think uh, that company has done a great job in repositioning itself when it comes to its business strategy and what has made you successful in the past necessarily is not going to make you successful in the future. I believe successful companies, successful businesses are constantly reinventing themselves, right? And uh, you don't stand still because there is no such a thing as a standing still. You actually will go backward versus staying at the same spot. So I think that's what PepsiCo has done. You know, they basically went through the process of saying, you know what, we have had great history, we've been extremely successful, but we need to fundamentally rethink who we are as a company and products and services we offer and show up in different ways. 
which is literally no different than what we have done. Yeah. What kind of financial growth have you experienced since you've become a cause-driven company? Well, first of all, the founding fathers of National Life started with a cause. I just want to make sure that it is clear that we are communicating our message, uh, a cause-driven organization, probably in much more clear ways today that we have done it in the past. So we have always been purposeful and cause-driven. And as far as what sort of a results we have seen, we have seen double-digit growth, as I mentioned, at the top line in terms of growth of the organization in an industry that traditionally has been flat to low single digit. And uh, we have experienced similarly at the bottom line results in terms of growing our capital as an organization and also growing uh, net income and uh, core earnings of the company at a record pace over the past six years. Uh, and I contribute all of that to our culture and our team at National Life because there is fair amount of emphasis on clear goals and objectives and communication being at the center of success of any business. You, have, you can have greatest ideas and strategies if it is not shared and embraced by everyone that is critical to the success of the goals to become reality, then you have less of a chance of success. And to that end, uh, I think that has been formula for success at our company. Tell us about how cause-driven leadership can impact results of a firm at every level. Cause-driven organizations have the ability not only to lay out what uh, their goals are at macro level, they can also break it down and uh, create smart goals uh, for everyone in the organization as to how they impact and influence the outcome of what we do as an organization in terms of goals at the top line and bottom line and create a sense of ownership and line of sight as to how every person contributes to the success of the organization. And when you create that sort of a alignment through clear communication and sense of ownership, it shows up absolutely at the bottom line. Um, you know, as an organization, since we are growing, we have to constantly think about how do we scale up? And it's not just about adding bodies, it is about thinking in new and creative ways and uh, taking what I refer to as taking the dumb out of the process and create simple processes. And my colleagues and my associates at National Life have done a phenomenal job of rethinking and re-engineering our processes to uh, simplify what we do as one of the oldest industries in the world, right? Through innovation and creative thinking. And everyone has played a role in making us easier to do business as an organization. Albeit, we are not a finished product. I want to put emphasis on that, that there is this continuous improvement going on. And sort of a mindset of, we got to get better, right? As we are growing as an organization. Because we have some uh, grandiose goals for the future of the organization. And that vision has inspired us to constantly think about what this next level is going to look like and how we need to show up as an organization. Now, the book also talks about how doing good for employees isn't just about providing cool perks, but is about building a collaborative work environment. Yes. How have you done this as a leader? That comes through in a couple of ways. First of all, we already talk about the culture. We already talk about communication. We talk about delayering the organization and uh, having leaders accessible to everyone in the organization. I refer to my senior team at, the co at our company as blue collar senior team, which my definition is we work for a living. We are not in the corner offices and we are sitting right in the middle of the population of our organization. Uh, and that brings into the picture the physical element of uh, our setup. Uh, we are in a very team-oriented environment. 
where we don't have uh, those so-called corner offices. The walls are glass in our physical setup. Uh, conference rooms are glass. There is this transparency in our organization that just creates different level of interaction and accessibility in the organization. And National Life, just like many other companies who've been around for 160 years, had this hierarchy of, you know, bigger title, bigger offices, and these walls, the cubicles with the tall walls and everything else. We just tore down the walls. It is bullpens, as I like to call them, which has brought different level of energy. Uh, we got to know each other better. You know, there were people who had worked together for 20 years who really didn't even know uh, much about each other. By changing our physical setup and creating that transparency, I think we made a major commitment in terms of the culture shift that we, we were committed to uh, as an organization. As a matter of fact, I sit right in the middle of our marketing uh, distribution and product area in a fishbowl, basically. And, and I can tell you that by just doing that, I have created probably 25% productivity gain by shorter meetings and having the ability as I walk through the hallways by touching base with my teammates and responding to their questions and having a good sense of what is going on with our key initiatives and very importantly, how my associates feel about what we are doing and what we can get better at. Do you feel like you have enough time to think strategically because of that? You know, I think the collaboration is fantastic that you have, right? And it really obviously has made a difference. Yes. What about when people really need to sit down and think strategically and need a little bit of space? Have you taken that into account? When Absolutely. You're when you're accessible, what is the downside, right? The role that I'm in is not a nine to five kind of a position. So my time to think strategically, my time to think through things is usually first thing in the morning, right? My days start at 5.30 in the morning and nothing like a good workout gets your mind to a place that, it, that needs to be to think about midterm and long-term goals of the organization. And also later in the day, that's really the time where you can sort of reboot and start thinking about the strategic goals of the organization. But also very importantly, as you are working with your teammates as a CEO, as a head coach, you have an opportunity of sort of being at 30,000, having the ability or know-how to dive in and go to a thousand uh, feet level and then climb back up to 30,000. I think that's absolutely doable. And that's one of the things that uh, you sort of learn as uh, you go through your journey as a leader. Now, how can cause-driven leadership help drive change through an organization and lead its people through change in an organization? You know, one of our mantras at our uh, company, National Life, is uh, servant leadership, right? And servant leadership is about accountability, empowerment, and respect, right? And as National Life, we not only we talk about our goals and objectives, we talk about accountability that every one of us has got to each other, and very importantly, to our clients. We talk about our ability to make strategic decisions and uh, make decisions when we need to with good facts and uh, good knowledge. And having respect for our cause, having respect for the service that we provide, and what the goals and objectives of the organizations are all about. So to that end, the mantra of servant leadership has served us well in terms of accomplishing what we are trying to do as a cause-driven organization. And servant leaders uh, are selfless and they understand that it is a privilege to serve and to lead. It is not a right. And it's something that you have to earn every single day. The book talks about how great companies 
help employees find heroism in work. Yes. Tell us about this concept. People uh, who are part of our organization need to understand in practical ways, in authentic ways, why what they do is impacting lives uh, in positive ways. And to that, and one of the things we have done at our company is to really talk about use cases, for lack of a better term, of uh, our services and how they show up in real lives as far as our clients are concerned. So we share with our teammates around our living benefits that we offer at National Life because at National Life, we actually offer the new kind of life insurance, the one that's not just about dying, the one which is also about the living, right? 60% of us, at some point in our lives, we will have some sort of a sh short-term disability, right? And through our products and services, we can help our clients who are going through that sort of experience. So we share real life stories of how we are helping families at the time of their need with our employees. So all of a sudden, our vision and mission becomes real for our clients in terms of why we refer to ourselves as do-gooders, right? And how we are influencing people's lives in positive ways. And to that mm -hmm. end, people start having a different perspective around perspective of reality versus fiction of do these products really work and do they really show up when our clients need them the most. What happens when employees aren't aligned with your cause? Is it just time to leave? Do you help them reassess? Excellent question. Excellent question. So, if somebody is not uh, sort of understanding it uh, and buying into it, our role is to educate them. Our role is to help them uh, understand it the way they need to understand it because all of us digest information in different ways. So n not everybody is going to get it exactly at the same time. Not everybody is going to receive it the way that uh, it is meant. So I think learning process is, di is different for everyone. And my recommendation to everyone who's going to start on a journey like this is to be very patient because this takes years, not months, especially is if your organization has been around for a long time, right? So to that end, when you're thinking about shifting a culture, it's going to take a while, right? And it needs to be continuous dialogue, continuous communication, and there, at times it comes down to intellectual wrestling. Please bear in mind, sometimes when you start a process like this, you have a group of people who are ready to embrace the change that you are promoting in an organization. There are early adopters, and then there are people who are sort of somewhat right in between and late adopters. And there are also people who are going to be cynical about this, right? And it's going to take them longer to digest. And last but not least, there are people who, at the end of the day, they're just looking for a job, right? And as a matter of fact, if you take a look at ch chapter five of this book, it talks about dead people working, right? Those are the people who show up at nine, they leave at five, they hate Mondays, they can't wait for Fridays, or they can't wait for happy hour after work. And you know, they are not really wired to think about what they do as, I'm gonna spend a bunch of my life doing this. I better be part of something that's relevant and meaningful to me. Something that does a lot of good and something that is satisfying to me. And I feel like I'm part of something that's bigger than just me. What are some things that leaders can do to transform their culture to be more cause-driven? Well, first of all, Figure out your personal goals, objectives, and passion. It starts with you, right? Because as you are creating the kind of a culture we are talking about, the purposeful and cause-driven culture, 
you got to be personally committed to it, right? As a chief executive officer, you cannot talk about culture if you're not going to live it, right? That doesn't mean you're going to be perfect, but if you're committed to it and you know that every day you got to get better, people who are working with you, who are, let's face it, they underwrite leaders every single day, they are going to realize that this is just bigger than words and CEO talk. It's something that you fundamentally believe in as a leader. It is in your toolkit and it is something that uh, you believe it is a key ingredient to the success of your organization. And when you speak about it, you need to be clear, you need to be authentic, and you have to be a good listener in terms of what your teammates are thinking about and what is the best way to get them to be part of the solution. And it's not about talking at them, it's talking with them. And the way you need to promote the ideas and the thoughts is to do it from top down, bottom up, middle up, middle down, every part of the organization. It is significant commitment of time and energy. And again, a key question is, how do you find the time to do everything that I just described? Well, if you believe fundamentally that this is critical to the success of the organization that you are building, and it is the secret sauce, right? Then you're going to make the commitment. Then you're going to make, uh, find the time. Because at some point, other teammates within the organization, at the top, at the bottom, in the middle, and every part of the organization, they become spokesperson for what you're trying to build as an organization. That is the time when you know as a head coach, your job is to back off and let the team take over. The book also talks about how some of the biggest detriments to the prosperity of an organization is when employees aren't passionate and engaged in their work. Yes. What are the ramifications of that for the organization? Well, the ramifications are people not really caring. It's J-O-B, it's a job, it's a paycheck, and there is lack of conviction and commitment to purpose that you serve as an organization. And the organization is gonna uh, basically suffer in major ways. It's just a matter of time for the organization to literally have poor results when it comes to top line and bottom line results of the organization. It, it is rotting from inside out. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm making that sound very really dramatic because I firmly believe it is that critical and it, the consequences are significant in my opinion. Tell us about some of the things that you're doing as a leader to ensure that your employees are passionate and engaged. Uh, listening, right? So one of the things that I do um, is talk to members of our team every opportunity I get, right? So whether it is in company, gym, first thing in the morning, whether it is in the lunch line, whether it is in town hall meeting or small group uh, type of a meetings with our associates, always ask them what do they think and how we can get better and ask for their opinion. Because you wanna have associates who are engaged, right? I use the phrase actively engaged. And it's easy to, in my opinion, it's easy to understand, are people really engaged and care or not? When people are talking to the leadership frequently and they get into the nuts and bolts of what they think and they ask you the tough questions, that says they really care. Versus walking by you and nodding their head versus when they see you, they're actually happy to see you as they have seen a good friend. So then how do you ensure that leaders don't become complacent and that they're not gonna be creating stagnant work environments? Uh, holding each other accountable, right? And I know many of the things I've mentioned to you, you're like, well, gosh, these are common sense kind of a stuff. They are, there is no rocket science here. It's like, are you consistent? 
Do you believe in it? Are you authentic? And are you showing up as such every single day? What do you think are some of the most important behaviors and traits a leader needs to exhibit to drive a cause-driven company? I think one of the key elements is uh, the concept of servant leadership, right? Understanding that as a leader, you have the privilege of serving others versus you were born to be a leader or you are so special that of course you're going to be in a leadership role. You got to make sure that every day is special and unique and you understand that accountability to thousand associates is accountability to thousand families, right? And I use the phrase accountability because effectively the decisions that you are making as the head coach has impact on many people. In my case, 22,000 people who represent national life across 50 states, I'm accountable to them my decisions so i better bring my a game every single day and i better educate my team and the entire body as to why that is important not only to our clients our number one priority uh, our producers and people who represent our organization and our associates at our company actually we believe we have two customers our buying customers and our selling customers and we treat each other as customers as well and I think that sort of creates a different culture as well. What kind of questions need to be answered when a leader defines their organization as mission driven or cause driven? I would refer to what you just asked as a moment of truth, right? Are you in it 110%? Are you in it because you believe in it? Or are you in it because it's really a job for you as well? Are you in a head coach role because you're passionate about the profession and the business that you're part of? Or is it a balance sheet type of a deal? CEOs are in a lot of ways judged when it comes to their success based on the balance sheet of the company. So if that's the only thing you're focused on, then you're not I would say being 100% authentic, right? So what is important is it starts with you as to being purposeful and mission driven and taking personal joy in part of what you are trying to build as an organization and serving your clients. And then it trickles down into the organization. And I think that's a key ingredient to success. Find your passion before you preach passion to other people. Because if you're preaching and not living it, you're exposed. The book also talks about how when a business becomes a cause, what follows is a movement. Correct. Explain what that means. Well, it is painting the picture around why you are in the business that you're in as an organization. What purpose does it really serve? At National Life, we are not making widgets or we are not making computers. We are making promises to people, to our neighbors, people on the main street, basically. And to that end, it is about fulfilling those promises many years from now. And purpose of what you're trying to accomplish is a major contributor in building the kind of organization you want to be part of. So painting that picture is a step one and creating a sense of ownership within the bowels of the organization and creating a sense of uh, oneness, right, creates that kind of a movement, right? When people can uh, intellectually understand something with their mind and make the level of commitment that we are talking about from their heart, heart and mind, creates a movement which becomes bigger than individuals from my point of view. And that's key ingredient to success. People I have a privilege of working with, I believe majority of our people, I'm not gonna tell you 100%, majority of them have got alignment in terms of why we are in this profession and why it is such an honorable profession to be part of. I mean, when you think about it, protecting families, 
business owners, helping families pay for college education, weddings, and the fact that at their most desperate times, we are there to protect their futures, is a worthy cause, right? Talk a little bit more about how leaders can build a movement versus just building a company. So it starts uh, with the goals and objectives of the organization. And it rolls into creation of a common vision, purpose, and values as an organization. Uh, it starts with clarity around that. And uh, I go back to the comment I made earlier, simple is hard, right? Is your vision, mission, and values are the type of things that you need to translate, right? If any of those three elements require translation, then they're not simple. And you're gonna have a hard time getting people to embrace it and own it, right? In order to create a movement, it has to be something that's easily understood and people understand why this matters, why is it relevant, right? And why do I want to be part of this? Why do I want to spend some of the most precious time of my life committed to this business? I believe everybody wants to be part of something that's special at their core. So it's important to ignite that, right? And for different people, it happens differently and at different times, right? And I would also tell you, there are certain group which really don't want to be part of anything like that. And their passion is probably more like their hobbies versus the profession that they're part of. For me, what we do is so relevant. What we do is so unique and special that I ask myself, what a privilege to wake up every day and serve our clients and impact lives in positive ways. Chapter eight of the book is titled, Will Buy for a Cause. People don't buy products, they buy better versions of themselves. Give us an example of what this means. Sure, from my point of view, what Jackie and Kevin are pointing out is when people understand what the goals and objectives of an organization are all about and how those companies are showing up in their communities, right? As citizens of the community, how do they take part in what is happening around them? That knowledge actually and a sort of a presence in the community encourages people to support those types of organizations and buy from cause-driven organizations. Because in this day and age, people actually care about what sort of a corporate citizens corporations are and what are their values and how they make the world around them a better place. So that's really the key ingredient behind the organizations that's mentioned in uh, Kevin and Jackie's uh, cause book. When leaders embrace cause-driven leadership, what are some of the biggest mistakes they can make that could impede their success? I would say number one on the list, from my point of view, is uh, having appreciation and embracement of cause-driven agenda at top level of the organization, not within the bowels of the organization, right? You cannot do group thinking at top layer of the organization and assume that you have buy-in within the bowels of the organization. Uh, because any change in any organization needs to start from bottom, middle, very importantly, and also the top. And I'm not speaking about within which order. I think the most critical element, however, is every segment of the organization should have alignment. Talk a little bit more about how leaders can use cause-driven missions to help them gain a competitive advantage within their industries? As simple as uh, it is to have appreciation for why mission-driven companies succeed, I would say it's not something that commonly is, is embraced uh, in corporate America because it's much more fashionable to talk about the balance sheet 
versus culture, right? So to that end, I think the companies who have strong balance sheets, companies which have proper governance and proper process to grow their business with discipline and their sustainable and responsible type of organizations, uh, when you add this element of mission-driven and the secret sauce of culture and having appreciation at all levels of organization as to why we do what we do, that becomes the jet fuel that takes your organization to the next level. It is an absolute competitive edge. So when you talk to leaders who have put emphasis on culture, and you mentioned some of the names, and some of the names that are mentioned within the book, they absolutely believe that that is uh, the jet field that has taken their organization to the next level. Now, when you're hiring talent yes. at National Life Group, how do you assess them to ensure that they have the capabilities needed to drive a mission-fueled organization? Part of our uh, interview process is to understand one's uh, technical competencies and capabilities. So it is about comprehension, competencies, communication skills, and uh, depending on the uh, discipline that we are hiring, their technical knowledge. The other part of it is who are they as a man or a woman, right? Uh, what are their values? Okay, what turns them on in terms of their professional life and their personal life? And learning about the person versus the candidate, right? Often when I uh, visit with people, I ask them to tell me about uh, uh, their upbringing. What has their personal journey been? Uh, I think it's pretty easy to have appreciation for what makes people um, do what they do. Corporate America has continuously struggled with diversity and inclusion. How can cause-driven leadership help drive inclusion across a company? It's pretty straightforward from my point of view. Mission-driven companies embrace people from all walks of life because they are responding to a higher calling. And you're including people who bring their technical knowledge, their capabilities, and who they are as a human being. And you end up la being less concerned with what is their ethnic background or what are their spirituality or where they come from. You're looking at the human being that's sitting in front of you. And does that person add to what you're trying to accomplish as an organization? Does that person make your team a stronger team and more of a complete team? Is this a person you want to have in the foxhole with you, accomplishing the goals that you want to accomplish? Well, great, Miran. This was really good. Thank, Thank you so you. much for joining us. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thank you. And we'll see you next time on Sartor TV.